Hello everyone, welcome to a new video on informatics. Today we are going to talk about recursion. So you might have seen that in a lot of problems uh, in computer science olympiads and in competitive programming in general, thinking recursively is the key to getting a problem right. There are quite a few problems which can only be approached using recursion and can be better solved using a recursive approach. Today we are going to talk about one such problem. It's a very famous problem and we're going to see it, which is usually solved using techniques in combinatorics, multiple techniques in combinatorics. A very famous way is the inclusion exclusion principle. We are going to have a new programming take on it and understand how recursion can transform the solution as well as how dynamic programming uh, helps in improving the recursive solution. So it's about two caveats. One is definitely recursion and the other one being dynamic programming and the impact of it on optimizing a solution because as many of you already know that a lot in programming depends on whether we can do stuff better as in if we can do it faster. So let's talk about the problem of misaddressed letters. Essentially, let's talk about a small sub case. There are n letters and n envelopes. So let's say just for our assumption n is equal to 4. So let me draw. So these are our four envelopes. Also, we have four letters corresponding. Let's define something called a good arrangement. A good arrangement or a correct arrangement would ideally be a one-to-one -one mapping as in let's call this envelope 1, let's call this envelope 2, let's call this envelope 3, let's call this envelope 4 and the corresponding letters let there be L1, L2, L3, L4. So in the good arrangement L4 should go to E4, L3 should go to E3, L2 should go to E2, L1 to E1 and so on and so forth. However, what we are currently interested in is an arrangement that is not good. As in, what we are looking for is a derangement. The simple question that this problem asks us is how many ways, in how many ways, and as I said, many of you might have seen this as a separate combinatorics problem before, in how many ways can n letters and n envelopes be arranged so that none of the letters lands up in its correct n. So that's the question that the problem is essentially trying to ask. Take a moment and try to find out what a derangement sequence can be for n equal to 4. Let's think about it. Would 2, 3, 1, 4 would be a valid derangement sequence? If you think about it, let's put their indices on top of them. 1, 2, 3, 4. So what this essentially means is Letter number 2 has found its way into envelope number 1. Letter number 3 has found its way into envelope number 2. Letter number 1 has found its way into envelope number 3. And letter number 4 though has found its way into envelope number 4. It might seem that 2, 3, 1 essentially here is a derangement sequence. But if we look at the entirety, if we look at the entire sequence that we have ended up with, in 2, 3, 1, 4, letter 4 has found its place in envelope 4 itself, which is definitely something that we do not want. If it has to be a proper derangement sequence, it's important that none of the letters, and we cannot stress on this enough, none of the letters lands up in its correct envelope. That is what we are looking for. So what could be a valid derangement sequence for n equal to 4? If we think about it, probably we can make something like 2, 4, 1, 3, put the indices on, and that's it. You can see that none of these two numbers are equal. If you think of this as an I sequence and if you think of this as a J sequence, no two of those numbers are equal. One letter number two has ended up in envelope number one, letter number four has ended up in envelope number two, letter number one has ended up in envelope number three, and letter number three has ended up in envelope number four. So none of the letters have ended up in their correct envelopes. This is a valid derangement sequence. What the problem asks is how many of them are there? Now, for these lesser cases like n equal to 4, n equal to 5 even, you would or you could try to manually work out the cases and try to find out what or how many such sequences you could find. The catch is the values increase very fast. That is, once you cross over to n equal to 6 or n equal to 7, and I mean the moment you reach over values of 10, you would see that the number of cases that get created, the number of derangement values that we'd be interested in are enormous. And it's definitely not a good idea trying to find those out manually. That is why we would resort to programming as well. If anybody is interested in finding out what is the number of ways in which um, 300 letters uh, and 300 envelopes can be totally deranged as such 
none of those 300 letters end up in their corresponding correct envelopes. If that's what we are looking for, then we would rather trust a computer or rather trust an algorithm to get the result for us. Obviously, the question boils down to how good our algorithm is. Before jumping on to that though, let's talk about thinking recursively, essentially what we are trying to discuss. We know that if we define a function, then this would be an algebraic definition of a function. And you could see that how this operates is that it takes an input value x and it returns you an algebraic computation of 2x plus 3. So if you feed in 5, it's going to return you 2 times 5 plus 3, which would boil down to 30. However, in a recursive function, we know that a function calls itself. A function is defined in terms of itself. If we talk about a very famous recursive function, Fibonacci function would qualify fn equals fn minus 1 plus fn minus. Let's quickly jump back to what we were seeing there. We were interested in the number of ways we could place four letters such that none of them were in their correct uh, envelopes. Can we find a recursive function for this? Well, of course we can. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are standard combinatorics techniques. If you use the inclusion exclusion principle, you can definitely find the number of qualifying cases. However, how can we have a recursive approach to this? We're going to do a case by case analysis and this is going to help us understand how this thing builds on towards dynamic programming as well. Let's say we have n letters, all of which are labeled a1, a2, a3, all the way till an. We also have n envelopes labeled p1, p2, p3, till pn. We define two distinct cases. The first case is where we try to see the impact of a particular situation. The situation being that letter a1 is in envelope p2 and letter a2 is in P1. So you can see that that's pretty much a representation of the derangement case for n equal to 2, isn't it? If n was equal to 2, we'd have had two letters and two envelopes, wherein we'd want letter 1 to go into envelope 2, letter 2 to go into envelope 1. That's the only solution possible. So are we trying to model this? Well, yes, in a way we are trying to model this, but there is a bigger picture going on as well. All these cases that we model, practically the two cases that we model, uh, are under the situation where AI is not in PI. This is what we are trying to investigate. None of the AIs should be in our PIs. Basically, I mean, if you're, if you're familiar with basic iterations, you know this. Like, in general, I do not want A2 to go into P2. I do not want A3 to go into P3. I do not want A4 to go into P4. I Generally, I do not want AI to go into PI. So these are the two cases that we break it into. So letter A1 is in envelope P2 and letter A2 is in envelope P1. But the rest of the letters, the rest of the letters. So firstly, which are the rest of the letters? Goes without saying the rest of the letters are A3, A4, all the way till AN. So none of these letters belong to their corresponding envelopes, which are P3, do not belong to P3, P4, P5, all the way till PN. In how many ways can we do this? Let us say that the answer to this case is d of n. I'm functionally assuming that let dn be the answer. Now, in how many ways can we firstly place a1 into p2 and a2 into p1? There's exactly one way to do that and we know it. I mean, it's very easy to visualize as well. If you have one letter and one envelope, you cannot place it wrongly in any way. I mean, you only have one letter and the corresponding envelope. So either you choose to place it or not place it. And since not placing it is not even an option, there's nothing we can do about it. So if there are two letters and two envelopes, then the only derangement that you can create is A1 going into P2 and A2 is going to P1, right? So obviously the only way is, is this for N equal to 2. And so for this sub case, obviously there's only one way you can do it. But how about the rest? How many, how many letters are left? If we were totally working with n letters as we are, then there are n minus 2 letters involved here clearly. And we want none of these n minus 2 letters to go into their corresponding correct envelopes. So what we just said, I said that let the answer be dn. And here is where I would want your attention specially, because this is the main theory of recursion. If we assume that dn is the answer, for n, dn is the answer for n, as in what we are trying to say is, let dn denote the number of ways in which n letters can be deranged. n letters and n envelopes, of course, can be deranged. So if you take a moment to think about this, if dn denotes the number of ways in which n letters can be deranged, what is the number of ways in which 
these many letters can be deranged? That's the question. There are only n minus 2 letters here. Why? Because we have already handled the case of A1 and A2 being in P2 and P1 respectively. We have talked about it. So how many letters are left? n minus 2 letters are left. And this is recursion. If dn is the number of ways in which n letters can be deranged, the number of ways in which n minus 2 letters can be deranged is definitely dn minus 2. So the answer, the, the contributing answer for this case is dn minus 2. And I hope all of you agree with that. So the number of ways, so we deliberately put A1 into P2, A2 into P1. We had N minus 2 letters left because totally we were working with N letters. We do not want any of these N minus 2 letters to go into their correct envelopes. Now, if DN in as per our general assumption is the number of ways in which N letters can be arranged, DN minus 2 is definitely the number of ways in which N minus 2 letters can be arranged. Quickly jumping on to case 2, guys. In case 2, we are... Let's always remember that we are still under the global case of AI not being in PI. That's the entire point of the problem, of course. In case 2, letter A1 is in envelope P2, but letter A2 is necessarily not in envelope P1. So here's a fun thing. In the previous case, we were constrained. Constrained in the sense that I deliberately put A1 in P2. I was totally justified in doing that because A1, the only corresponding correct envelope of A1 was P1. We didn't put it in P1 because the problem didn't allow us to do that. We are interested in derangements. Now, I'm saying that I'm going to keep A1 in P2, but A2 is not necessarily in P1. Why is that? Because if I, if I constrained A1 to stay inside P1, then that's going to be a limiting case for us. And we have already handled that in case 1. In case 2, I want to give the letter A2 that degree of freedom that it can find out any other letters as well. Because A3, A4, AN, in the previous case 1, we deranged them amongst themselves. But A2, we sort of bound it only to P1. We are obviously not denying the fact that P1 is a derangement option for A2. But we should be open enough to allow it other options as well. That explains the need for case 2, which is why we are saying letter A1 is definitely still in P2, yes. But letter A2 is not in envelope P1, correct? So... How many ways can we do this? We saw that the contributing factor for the previous case was dn minus 2. What would be the contributing factor for this case? Let's find out. And it's very easy. I think some of you might even try to guess, work it out the same way we were working in case 1. The approach is exactly similar. Now, A1 being in P2, obviously, there's only one way to do that. And once again, let's always remember, this is our global point of reference that we have assumed that let dn be the answer. Number of ways in which n letters can be arranged is dn. And that's what we applied in the previous case as well. Here, how many letters have we got? A1 to P2 is fixed. A1 to P2 is fixed. What we have left are A2, A3, all the way till A2, A3, all the way till AN. The candidate envelopes, the candidate envelopes where they can be placed are P1, P2, P3, all the way till PN. Correct? Of course, uh, I need to change this. Candidate envelopes are P2, P3, Pn. Why P2, P3, Pn? Why not P1? Simply because I have not placed A2 in P1. I'm, I'm not even counting that as an option, right? I'm not even counting that as an option. A2 won't find its place in P1 this time around. So how many letters are we trying to derange now? Earlier, we were trying to derange A3, A4, An. That was N minus 2 letters. Currently, we are trying to derange A2, A3, AN with just the condition that A2 is not in P1. So if DN is the number of ways in which N letters can be deranged, and as we use this exact same logic to find out DN minus 2 as the contribution, so then here, if DN is the number of ways in which N letters can be deranged, what is the number of ways in which N minus 1 letters can be deranged? Why N minus 1? Because you can clearly see the number of letters that we are now trying to derange are N minus 1. Earlier, we were not including A2 because we had specifically constrained that A2 is supposed to be in P1 only. Here, though, we are saying that A2 is definitely going to, uh, going to find its place in uh, one of these envelopes from P2 to P3 till P, and obviously it's not going to be in P2 because that's exactly what the point is. I mean, AI not in PI globally holds true, correct? So the number of letters that we are trying to derange here is N minus 1. So our question essentially still stays the same. In how many ways can we derange N minus 1 letters? And if DN is the number of ways in which we can derange N letters, then definitely the number of ways we can derange N minus 1 letters is DN minus 1. That's the entire beauty of recursion. That's the entire beauty of recursion in the sense that we can realize that just by having a template, having a template as in when we assume that the number of ways in which n letters can be deranged is going to be dn, we never knew what its value is going to be. I don't know what the value of d4 is. I don't know 
what the value of d5 is or for that matter d100 is. I do not know the specific value of dn. What I do know is the concept and I'm utilizing that concept to justify or rather to find out. I'm utilizing that concept to find out answers to miniature cases. Using dn, I'm trying to find out an interpretation for dn minus 1, dn minus 2 and that helps me represent the cause of my problem. So we have found out that case 2 has a contribution of dn minus 1, with case 1 having a contribution of dn minus 2 as we have seen earlier. Now note, in these two cases, we are finally ready with our final recursion. Over these two cases, you can see that a1 has been in envelope p2. Both in case 1, we had constrained a1 to be in p2. In case 2 as well, we have constrained a1 to be in p2. But can't we ask ourselves, how many incorrect positions, how many incorrect positions are there for the letter A1? Think about that as I jump on to conglomerating the recursion. So obviously you can see that case 1 and case 2, we can simply join them up by the addition principle. And obviously we might be tempted to say that dn is equal to dn minus 1 plus dn minus 2. But is that all? Obviously not because this is important as well that how many incorrect positions are there for the letter A1? Ask yourselves. Obviously, it's very easy to understand that there are n minus 1 incorrect positions not only for A1 but for any letter we might be interested in. Why n minus 1? Because obviously, the only correct letter for any, I mean, the only correct envelope for any letter is going to be AI to PI, right? The only correct envelope for A1 is P1. So, the number of incorrect positions are definitely going to be any of P2, P3, P4, P5, all the way till PN. And that just makes its way to the count n minus 1. So there are n minus 1 incorrect positions. And this representation, this analysis of two cases that we did was just for one incorrect position. Which incorrect position? It was A1 in P2. That's the constraint. In case 1, we kept A1 in P2. In case 2, we kept A1 in P2 as well. We allowed A2 and the other letters that degree of freedom to derange them amongst themselves in any which ways they please, right? So that is why there are n minus 1 incorrect positions available for letter A1 and we have till now accounted for only one of those. So to get the final recursion, what is the one thing that we need to do? Just multiply this thing with n minus 1. And this is the recursion that we were looking for. dn equal to n minus 1 times dn minus 1 plus dn minus 2. You can easily note how similar this is to the Fibonacci reference relation. Yes, only if it was not for this n minus 1, right? But we do have this n minus 1 and the significance also is something that we discussed because there are n minus 1 incorrect positions for letter A1 to be placed. So you could see how modeling a solution in terms of its global answer that we assume that let's say dn, even though we didn't know what the value was, we assume that let's say that we could have a template or we could have an objective function which would give us the number of ways in which n letters can be deranged which is why we could also find out interpretations for the lower cases. That is how we arrive at this final recursion. Let's take a look at how we can code this and how dynamic programming makes an impact there. Obviously, optimization is the key as in any computer science uh, problem. So this was the video in which we discovered the recursion as such. We expressed the problem in terms of a recurrence relation and this is going to be the governing recurrence relation that gives us the answer to the problem. However, for a coding explanation, stay tuned for our next video, wherein we also talk about dynamic programming. We would implement both the cases, a recursive solution and a DP solution, and why the DP solution is better. Obviously, we will touch upon the all-important topic of what dynamic programming is and why is it important. Thank you. Hope to catch all of you in the next video.